In this video, we will be covering oxymercuration, demercuration with alkenes. So, so first I want to start off by saying that there are two parts to this chemical reaction. And the first part involves oxymercuration, while the second part and second half involves demercuration. So with ox oxymercuration, we are going to see mercury 2 acetate. And mercury 2 acetate is basically a, uh, uh, an ion or a metal ion that, that's going to serve as our electrophile in this chemical reaction. While sodium borohydride is going to serve in the demercuration part of the reaction, and, and that's just a common reducing agent that is typically used in organic chemistry. And, and since, I, since I bring this up, I want to also say that uh, Oxymercuration, demercuration can sometimes be called oxymercuration reduction, and, and really it just depends on, on what textbook you are, you are referring to this in, but, but if it says ox oxymercuration reduction, just know that, that it's called reduction because the sodium borohydride, or basically the, the second half to the chemical reaction, involves a reducing agent. So, so that is where they get uh, reduction from. Now let's just move forward and, uh, and show a chemical reaction. So for example, I said, well, I said in the beginning that I'd be using alkenes, so what we will do is we will show a pi bond here, and we will show our first step involving mercury 2 acetate. We'll add some water in here. And then in our second step, we will add our sodium borohydride. And keep in mind, one and two, that, that just simply indicates that that we are treating this chemical reaction systematically with these ingredients and, and we are not adding everything all at once. So, so I want to make that point. Now let's just show some electron pushing. Now this pi bond is going to serve as our nucleophile and the mercury is going to serve as our electrophile. So, so let's just demonstrate the, uh, the next step to this chemical reaction now. So basically what we are going to show is this, where we have a bridged species with mercury acetate, we will have a, a positive charge right here. And, and I'm just calling it a bridged species, but, but I mean, it's also known as a mercurinium ion, and, and you can pretty much use one of those two names interchangeably. I, I like to call it a bridged species because that helps remind me that I am working with a bridge, and and when I know I'm working with a bridge, I know that I am not going to see carbocation formation. And if I don't see carbocation formation, I'm not going to see rearrangement. And if I don't have rearrangement, I don't have to worry about uh, a mess of products that could, that could result from, from all of those rearrangements. So, so anyway, I wanted to, to make that point. Now, the next thing I want to show is that this bridge is actually attached to two carbons. And this carbon on bottom is going to be a secondary carbon while the carbon on top is going to be a tertiary carbon. And, and keep in mind too that both of these carbons are going to both bear a partially positive charge. And, and that's just simply due to this mercury pulling and withdrawing electron density from both of these carbons to help stabilize this, this full positive charge attached to the mercury. So, so I want to demonstrate that. And, and the reason why I feel the need to, to talk about this is because when we show our second nucleophilic attack with water, what we end up seeing is that we have a choice to make. We have basically two partially positive carbons that, that we could attack. And, and what we end up doing is we choose the one that has the highest degree of substituents in terms of, of substituents that are not related to hydrogen atoms. So, so we end up going with the tertiary carbon. And, and by the way, you can also uh, go back and, and refer to hyperconjugation because hyperconjugation will explain that that a tertiary carbon is going to be more stable than a secondary carbon and a secondary carbon is going to be more stable than a primary carbon and and so for those reasons when we are when we are looking at partially positive carbons well well that's that's basically the the, the stabilization that that helps to uh, to you know the carbon to be able to basically withstand that type of charge. So, so anyway, I just wanted to, to point that out. And, and the other thing I want to mention too is that we are going to come in in an anti-addition. So let me just write anti-addition. 
and I am referring to the to the nucleophilic attack. Now, now basically, we could have come in from you know a sin addition or an anti addition, and and we didn't come in from the sin addition because remember we have a bridge, and and that bridge is actually going to take up a lot of space, and when it does that, it actually sterically or or it basically hinders the nucleophile from coming in from that from that direction. So as a consequence to that, the nucleophile will, will come in from the opposite side of the, of the bridge relative to the ring. And, and so, so for that reason, we have anti-addition. And, and in, I suppose I can also conclude that by saying we also have stereospecificity. So let me just demonstrate that. Now, now let's just move over and show our, our next step. And by the way, this bridge opened when I, when I, when I demonstrated that nucleophilic attack as well. So, so the next step is going to consist of something like this, where I have this water molecule attached now, the positive charge. Then over here, I'm going to have my mercury acetate because it it broke apart from that from that ring structure. Now notice that I've used wedges and dashes, and and I've done that to indicate that that now we are working with the trans conformation, and, and I did that because you know we came in from an anti addition, and and I suppose I can I can further demonstrate that with a Hayworth projection because. Remember, Hayworth projections are actually excellent at, at demonstrating cis and trans conformations. So, so let me just demonstrate that really quick. So basically what I'm saying is that I have one substituent pointing on bottom and one pointing on top. And, and I can just make this my, my mercury acetate. And over here I, could just, I can make this my water. So, so I hope that was helpful. Now, now let's just move forward and, and demonstrate that you know we, we now have this this positive charge on this water, but but that's not going to be a problem because you know we're an aqueous solution, and, and as a result of that, we have we have many water molecules floating around, and, and they can basically serve as bases that can deprotonate the hydrogen that's that's giving the uh, the positive charge we don't want. So we can show something like this where we pluck this hydrogen off and and. Uh, and now we can move forward with our next step. So the next step will be demonstrated like so. Keep this wedge. Now I just simply have an alcohol or a hydroxyl group, whichever you prefer. Over here I have my mercury acetate. Now, now this is where the chemical reaction gets gets real interesting because because now we are going to add our sodium borohydride, and and basically what happens with this is well well first of all I mentioned at the at the beginning of the video that this is going to serve as a reducing agent and and as a result of that we are going to replace this mercury acetate with a hydrogen atom. But, but as a result of that, we actually see and find that we lose stereospecificity. So, so that's what makes it actually pretty interesting. And, and you, know, you might ask, well, well, how do you lose stereospecificity? How, how, how does that work exactly? Well, well, basically through empirical evidence, I mean, the stereochemical results vary from case to case. So, so in other words, if you were to, you know, say, run this experiment in a lab setting, well, well you might find that you have 50% uh, of, of a cis conformation, well, well you have 50% of, of a trans conformation on the other side. So, so basically it, it loses its stereospecificity, and, and it's really done so through, through randomization is how, how it was described to me. And, and, and by randomization, I'm, I'm saying that, you know, it's not necessarily an SN2 reaction because with an SN2 reaction, at least you would, you would know you have inversion or, or you have something to refer to in, in terms of determining its, its conformation. But, but you don't have that either, and, and like I said, as a result, you, you just end up with, uh, with a molecule that, that has lost stereospecificity. So, so let me just demonstrate the next example now. Keep my arrows consistent. Keep this as a wedge. 
And over here I'm just going to draw two hydrogens. And, and I'm not going to show them on wedges or dashes because as I've mentioned before, we, we lost our stereo specificity. So, so now the next thing I want to say is that, I mean, even though we lost stereo specificity, well, well, that doesn't necessarily mean that we don't have stereo chemistry because remember, those are two different things because stereo chemistry, keep in mind, that refers to stereo isomers. And, and by stereo isomers, if you have chiral carbons, you, you can establish enantiomers and diastereomers from those. So, so stereo chemistry basically is going to provide a, another uh, or an additional three-dimensional perspective and analysis from, from, uh, from a different viewpoint. So, so I want to be able to establish that if I am able to. So, so let's just see if we have four different substituents. Now, the first thing we want to do is check this one and I'm referring to a substituent, so we'll move around in this direction. And then we could look over on the other side, do the same thing. And we find that we're working with the same thing on, on both sides, so, so it actually doesn't have four substituents, and as a result of that, we will not see a chiral carbon, and as a result of that, we do not have a, uh, we don't have, we, or we can't show stereochemistry. So we can just basically keep the molecule as is, and, and uh, let's say that, that are, that's our final answer. Now, now let's demonstrate one more example to this, and what we can do is we can show something with sodium borohydride again, but, but in this case, we can show something that has uh, deuterium instead of hydrogen. So, so let's just demonstrate that, and let me see here. Suppose we can start off with another alkene and change my colors. So basically we have something like this and we show our first step again and this is our uh, mercury 2 acetate and instead of adding water this time we can add methanol and in our second step we can show sodium borohydride but remember this time I said I wanted to add deuterium instead of hydrogen so I will show D4 instead of H4. So let's just show some electron pushing. And in our next step, we will see something that looks like this. Once again, we have our bridged species. The positive charge. And just in case if you're wondering what happened to the other acetate, uh, because remember, there, there are two acetates right here, but, but basically one was knocked off when we, when we showed that nucleophilic attack initially from the pi bond, so, so I want to mention that. Now we have two carbons right here. This is going to be our primary. This is going to be our secondary. Over here, this is going to be our methanol. Show some lone pairs. demonstrate a nucleophilic attack and remember it was anti-addition so we had stereo specificity so in the next step We will show this, and I will demonstrate another wedge for our ether. And by the way, there is a hydrogen right here, but, but remember, just as I've, as I've demonstrated in our previous example, this, this actually gets uh, plucked off and, and deprotonated by, by either a water molecule, because we are in aqueous solution, or by a, a, a methanol. Either one will, will do the job. So, so over here, we can show our mercury acetate. And I drew the I drew this as a wedge, and I drew the other one as a dash because remember we we do show a trans conformation, so I've indicated that. Now our next step is going to involve the sodium borohydride, and and remember this is the the interesting part of the chemical reaction because through randomization we lose our stereo specificity.
So, so what's, what's different about this chemical reaction from our previous one is that instead of replacing mercury acetate with hydrogen, now we are going to replace it with deuterium, or with a deuterium. And we could just keep our ether wedged. And over here, there was always an implied hydrogen. I just, I just didn't draw it. So, so we will show our implied hydrogen, and and I demonstrated that with a with a dashed line to make things convenient when we are assigning priorities to show enantiomers. So, so let's just show stereochemistry now by by looking for a uh, chiral carbon, and we can do that by by assigning priorities. So we move in this direction. We have an S configuration, and there is no need to invert because our lowest priority group is pointing away from us. In addition to that, we can show the enantiomer, and we can actually do that quite simply by, by simply uh, interchanging these, these wedges and dashes. So in other words, what was wedged before will, will be dashed now. And what was dashed before will be wedged. Go back and assign priorities. So we move in this direction, S configuration. However, there is inversion because our lowest priority group is pointing toward us rather than away. So we end up with an R configuration. So, so that's how we establish enantiomers. Now, now one last thing before I close this video, I want to demonstrate how I was able to determine that, that we had enantiomers in the first place. So, so basically, if I go back and look at this molecule and I rearrange it or, or basically put it at a different angle, what I can see is that, suppose I can just keep it the same color, but So I'll make my hydrogens here, make another hydrogen. This is going to be my secondary carbon, so this is going to be my, my uh, electrophilic center. And remember, we, we were working with methanol, so I'll just draw methanol right here. Well, remember, with a pi bond, we are working with a flat molecule or a planar molecule that is sp2 hybridized. So if it's flat, remember, you know, my nucleophilic attack can come in from either side of the, of the, of the planar molecule. And as a result of that, if I have a bridge, say, on this side of the molecule, positive charge, well, I will come in from this side and establish one enantiomer. And conversely to that, if I have a bridged species on this side of the molecule, I can come in from this side and show the other enantiomer. So, so that is oxymercuration, demercuration with alkenes and stereochemistry.